Hello and welcome to Devil's Advocate. Was the Home Minister right to address the general session of the jamaat e ulema or was it a way of covering up this government's neglect of the real problems the Muslim community faces? Those are the issues I shall discuss today with the Minority Affairs Minister, Salman Khurshid. Mr. Khurshid, let's start with the Home Minister's decision to address the general session of the jamaat e ulema e hind Given that Indian Home Ministers don't address the Catholic Bishops' Conference, the Sikh Sangat or Sadhu Samelans, is it fitting that he should have addressed 10,000 ulema? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure on my facts about uh, uh, Indian ministers not attending other religious gatherings, uh, but I certainly know that as far as the Jamatul ulama Hind is concerned, uh, our senior leaders have uh, been to their conventions in the past. But not your senior ministers, maybe leaders of the party. There's a distinction between the party and the government. This is the home minister of a secular government suddenly addressing 10,000 ulema. Well, they may be ulema, they may be ordinary workers, they may be ordinary people, uh, but these are, uh, this is an important segment of our society and there has to be dialogue and I think many of their concerns are often directed not, not as most of us, but at the Home Minister, the concerns about security and they did in fact take a very, very positive position on terrorism and I think the Home Minister felt that he should go and encourage them. And this. they took a very strange and if not questionable position on Vande Mataram, but I'll come to that in a moment's time, and they did that on the very day the Home Minister went. One small question on that. Is our Home Minister's intelligence so poor, so abysmally lacking, that he had no knowledge that he was going to be embarrassed, almost sabotaged by this? Resolution. Well, you know, they, it's a huge gathering and a lot of, lot of little resolutions are passed. Um, and for the Home Minister, once he's got his program fixed, uh, to uh, call his program off and, and then revise everything just because there is information that such a, such a resolution has been passed is one thing. But certainly from what I understand, he was not, he was not fully aware that such a resolution has so been So his intelligence passed. is so poor, he had no idea what sort of ambush he was walking into. Well, or if he was aware, he didn't want to change it because he thought it would be a discourtesy. It's it a bizarre be, explanation. Listen, listen, there could be many reasons. You have to take a call when you're in the hot seat. Uh, will, uh, will your going be counterproductive? Will your not going be counterproductive? And I think he's taken a call, he's made a decision. He's taken I, the wrong call. He embarrassed the government, he embarrassed himself, and I now he's bending over backwards to find explanations. I don't think so. I mean, I was asked the same day and I've, I took a position. And you didn't go. That's the important no, I, thing. You I didn't attend the Jamaat, although you are Minority Affairs Minister, you perhaps had a responsibility to go. You didn't for that very reason. There could, have been, there could have been many reasons for my not going, but let me just put one fact straight. This was not the Jamaat. There are two factions of the Jamaat. Mr. Asad Madni, who was the president, his brother became the president after him and remains the president of one faction of the Jamaat. His son, Mr. Mahmood Madni, who, who was the general secretary or an important person in this Jamaat, holds this faction together. Now, so to say that this is the view of the Jamaat, I think is difficult Even to accept. Even more listening to your explanation, there is a reason for not going. When the Jamaat itself is split, the Home Minister shouldn't be taking sides with one or the it's other. Worse, let me put something been, else to you. Yeah. Look what he's ended up doing. He's ended up giving prominence to the most conservative, the most insular elements of the Muslim community at the cost of the liberal, the modern and the forward thinking. Is that what a secular Home Minister of a democratic country should be doing? How do you get this thing out of your system? If you don't discuss, if you don't debate, did he endorse anything they said? The answer is no. But he did encourage them. He did encourage them on their position on terrorism. And he did say that what you have said on terrorism applies not only to Muslims alone, but to everybody in this country. And I think that's a wonderful thing that he did. Let's does. move beyond the Home Minister, because in a sense, he's only a reflection of a bigger problem. It's the bigger problem I want to come to. Why does your government, whether it's the Home Minister or whether it's the other elements of the government, continually identify Indian Muslims in terms of their religion rather than in terms of their appalling economic circumstances, their poor political representation, and their bad schooling facilities. Why don't listen, you look at those instead? Listen, uh, this would be right if we hadn't worked so hard on such a committee. If we hadn't, if we hadn't actually set up such a committee, if we hadn't accepted the recommendations of such a committee, and we weren't now at this very moment in the process of setting up the Equal Opportunity Commission. You know, this is very interesting. 
You use the Sachar Committee to justify your real attention to the problems that face the Muslim community. But the truth is that it's three years since the Sachar Committee report was handed to the Prime Minister. That happened on the 17th of November. It's almost three years since it was tabled in Parliament. That happened on the 30th of November. But even till today, no action taken report has been tabled in Parliament. And most people question if it even exists. Well, <laughs> the action? I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm supposed to ensure that it's implemented. 90 districts have been earmarked. 2,500 crores have been allotted. Another 1,000 crore will hopefully come in the, mid uh, in the, in the midterm review of, of the Planning Commission. Uh, we've actually increased our scholarships to Muslim children, minority children, from 6, from six lakhs to 50 lakhs. We've, we've yes, got 600 scholarships. applications of perhaps tens or twenties of million. What you've done well, is a drop in the ocean. Well, but come it's back, come a, back it's to the a beginning. It's a beginning. Come back you, to the action uh, taken yeah, report. Sure. Your predecessor, A.R. Antale, went on record to say that the action taken report would be tabled in Parliament in February 2007. Two years and nine months later, what's happened? No, no, no. I, I, I think, I think uh, you've got it wrong. I am. The I've action, got it right. He said the so. Action com the action taken report was presented to Parliament. What, was, what didn't happen in Parliament was a full discussion on such a committee. The action, the action taken I've report is there because I've, I have read the action, com, action taken report. It hasn't report been tabled myself. in Parliament. It may, have been, it, may, it, may, it may be it's, there in your ministry. But just, but just look Abdul at it. Abdul Saleh Sharif, the member yeah. secretary of the such a committee commission, has gone on record to say that the action taken report hasn't been presented. I'm, He's gone further. Yeah. He says that practically every important recommendation, bar the one you mentioned regarding scholarships, has been ignored. Occasionally, he says, the government has says they will act on it, but beyond the record, well, let me they've just done tell nothing. You, let me just tell you officially then. Let me just tell you officially. There is one recommendation that we have not accepted, one single, and that is to have a nationwide cadre of WAF officers. Everything else has been accepted. Everything else has been accepted. It's the uh, subsequent recommendations that I, I imagine are coming in the new report, the report of the Rangnath, uh, Rangnath Mishra Commission, which is yet not placed before Parliament, that they may be fe feeling that those, those recommendations have not been implemented, but how can they All be? Right, you say only one recommendation of such a hasn't been accepted, everything else has been. So let's come to some of the more important recommendations. Let's test them with you. you right? The such a report asked for an equal opportunities commission. They believed it was an important way of improving Muslim representation in jobs. So far, your government has not committed itself to that. I'm telling you, I'm committing myself to that what, now. Here and now for the first time? No, 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 no. Please listen. Planning Commission has looked at it. We've looked at it. Uh, Law Ministry has looked at it. The, 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 the report is now ready. A GOM is being, is being set up to, to work out the details of where this commission will be located. We will bring this, this legislation before Parliament in the coming session. I want to get you to repeat that because I think it's important. You're giving me a guarantee that your government has not only accepted the proposal for an Equal yes. Opportunities Commission, yes. but you would implement it as well. Yes, yes. When? When? And listen, when? The, only, the only time that we now require is for the GO, GOM, which will probably meet very soon, to work out the location of this commission. Otherwise, during this session, it will be before the House. For any unavoidable reason, it doesn't come in this session, it will come in the next session. Legislation. Why, why can't is, it come in this session? No, it's already three years since the no, report no, was submitted. Understand. Why can't it come please, in this please, session? Uh, please understand. We have 13 commissions. There was the overlap problem that we had to resolve. We have to go to 13 different ministries. We have to go to You've the law ministry. It's taken three years to do it. You've had a lot of time. It's, it's not yes, that the it's suggestion taken, came yesterday. We, 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 we've taken more than four years to get the, uh, get the legislation on, on corporates before Parliament. What's the, chance, time. what's the chance that the session of Parliament that begins on the 19th of November will be the session that sees this bill passed? I think, it's it, a, I think there's a very good chance. There's a very good chance. Okay. Please understand, I have also informed the Secretariat. I have informed Parliament Secretariat that we intend to introduce this bill during this session. How hopeful are you that the bill will be passed rapidly as opposed to being sent to standing committees and buried there? Well, nothing is buried in standing committees, but sometimes when you have an important bill of consequences that are far-reaching, Parliament itself decides... Have you consulted you the opposition parties and your ally parties to get a consensus, or is that no, still no, to be you done? Can't, you, do, you can't do that. You can't do that on Parliament except through, 
except through consultative committees where we have been talking about it till such time as the legislation comes before. It's parliament. quite possible for you to approach the BJP. It's quite possible for you to approach the left and to get their opinion before you present the bill no, so that you ensure quick, that successful is, passage. That is not our system. Politicians talk amongst themselves, but formally parties are consulted only when legislation so comes. So in other parliament. words, you haven't consulted anyone and you've I'm only done this you, internally I'm within the government. I'm not telling you whether we've consulted or not. After all, this is based on a report of outstanding people of great minds. We've We've gone to a lot of institutions, we've talked to a lot of lawyers, we've talked to a lot of civil society people. It's, it was on the web, it was on the web. Okay. So Let's come then to another important recommendation of the Sachar Committee. This time they're concerned about the poor Muslim political representation. And one of their recommendations is that in constituencies where Muslims are in greater proportion and numbers than Dalits, such constituencies should not be reserved for Dalits. Can you accept that? Can I accept the recommendation? I don't think this recommendation has come from them. This recommendation, I understand. This is part of the Sachar report. Coming. It's, they only hinted at this, but this. They mentioned it. No, part of the which is the report. reason? Because they mentioned it. A new commission was set up. The Rangnath Mishra Commission was set up. The Rangnath Mishra Commission was supposed to look, look at this specifically. That report is not before so Parliament. The idea and this proposal to correct the poor representation of Muslims in we Parliament find, that's why is still but, stuck in committees. But, committee listen, after committee will carry on, but there'll be absolutely, no solution. Absolutely, because. It is not something you don't you don't change the, your polity overnight because every time you do but you something, don't agonize you for away. three years and keep pushing it from one committee to the next. That's the way of no, not no, taking I, a decision. No, no, no. That's not at that's not at all the case. Where we thought we needed immediate intervention, education, jobs, we've done it. I'm, just I'm just even, with limited reference to scholarships. It's only about fifty thousand, I believe, that you've created scholarships. No, there I'm sorry. Tens to 50, 20. It'll be 50 lakhs next year. It's 29 lakhs this year. Whoever's given you this information has not been fair. 50 lakhs next year, 29 lakhs this year. Compared to perhaps 40, 50 million people replying. No, no, no. no, no. I, there are Rajasthan, Andhra Pradesh, where we've got three times or four times the numbers, numbers that we have actually provided to them. That's the reason why we're going to you 50 lakhs. You brought up Andhra Pradesh a moment to go. Why can't you take a leaf out of your own Andhra Pradesh government book and arrange laws that will permit Muslims to be co-opted to panchayats, to municipalities, to agricultural marketing committees, and even to cooperative bank committees? That would give them a meaningful meaningful role in institutions that determine their life. You That's a step your government in Andhra has taken. Why can't you take it here? No, 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 no. But please understand, as the step taken in Andhra Pradesh still needs endorsement. Three times, constitutional benches have struck it down. It's still before a constitutional bench in Andhra Pradesh. It's pending a judgment. It's been, it's been reserved for a judgment. That's a very important input that we have. There's Tamil Nadu, there's Karnataka. Are you is, inclined to move in that direction? We said, we said so in our manifesto. And if you ask me... But there's a lot of things you no, say in no, your no, manifesto no, no. that but you we don't are commit, do. We are committed to, our, committed to it in our manifesto. I repeat that again. We you are, are working, committed to this particular we are working, thing. Absolutely. I'm saying it to you again. We are committed to this. But what we are looking at is two things. One is what kind of model of backward, backward minorities we should implement. Should it be the Karnatak model or should it be the Andhra and model? The Can I explain the difference? The difference is in Karnatak model, in 27% for backwards, you give a separate portion for backward minorities or backward Muslims. That's what you do in, Andhra, in, in, uh, Karnatak. in Karnatak. And in Karnatak, you declare all minorities, all Muslims as backwards. That's the Karnatak model. Andhra Pradesh, you take all Muslims minus four or five categories like Sheikh, Sayyid, Patans, etc. And then you give them 4% beyond the 27. When they were given five, it went to 51, etc. Et so we have to choose but, what is most sustainable but how for center. quickly will you come to a... I can't give you a dateline on this, but this will is this, a high... Will this process go on forever? That's this what is a high priority. No, I can, a high priority. I can say this to you. It's a high priority. We are looking at it all the time. We are working on it 24 into 7. Please believe me, this is something that we will do. It's a commitment. Our leaders have said we will do it, but we'll do it in a sustainable manner. I don't want to give a model that's struck down okay. by courts tomorrow. You said, please believe me. I'll believe you. The yeah. bigger question is, will the Muslim community who's been waiting for three years... Why don't you go you? and ask them for Rosa about Let's take a break in a moment's time and come back and talk to you about specifically the jamaat e ulema resolution and ask you your opinion of it as Minister of Minority Affairs. That's in a moment's time. See you after the break.
Welcome back to Devil's Advocate and an interview with the Minority Affairs Minister Salman Khushid. Salman Khushid, let's come to the Jamaat e Ulema's resolution calling upon Muslims not to sing Vande Mataram. You've already said that this was an unnecessary resolution, but can you go one step further? Can you, as Minister of Minority Affairs, criticize and condemn the resolution? Well, I think it's uh, it's a resolution that uh, that has no basis whatsoever. I sing the Vande Mataram in Parliament, outside Parliament, in my party office, every time we have flag hoisting, we sing Vande Matra. Are you proud to sing Vande Matra? Absolutely. I'm not only proud, but I'm committed. I consider it my obligation. And I consider it my political obligation because my leaders, Maulana Azad and Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, sat together and set to rest whatever questions there were about Vande Matram and the stanzas of Vande Matram that people were objecting In to. which case? Given that you sing it with pride and given that the controversy was set to rest by Maulana Azad and Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru almost 50 years ago, I repeat my original question. Can you today criticize and condemn the Jamaat resolution? I, when you say this is unnecessary, this is counterproductive, is that not criticism? Those are euphemisms. Why don't you no. say up front, I condemn that resolution? No, no. Condemn, I, I condemn anything that is wrong. I think this is, is this unnecessary. It is unacceptable. It is unacceptable. Now, I think for an organization as big as the Jamaatul al Hind, with all the eminent people it has, for me to use harsher words makes no sense. I am saying it's unacceptable. It's counterproductive. It is not good for our society. It's not good for India. It's not good for Muslims. One other thing. The resolution doesn't simply tell Muslims not to sing Vande Mataram, it goes one step further. It demands, and I quote, that the issue of Vande Mataram not be deliberately raised for causing communal discord and a threat to law and order. Do you believe that those who sing Vande Mataram do it to provoke Muslims? Well, some do, but I couldn't be provoking Muslims. I sing it. I sing it, but when, when somebody from a, from, from a die-hard extremist party says, Bharat mein rehna hai to vande matram kehna hai, is that not provocation? I sing it not to provoke, I sing it with pride as I told you, I sing it with commitment, I, I, I sing it with a sense of, of patriotism, but when somebody says something, something ugly in that manner, isn't that provocation? That it's a tragedy, it's a tragedy that someone is insisting that we don't sing this because they have a strange notion of nation notion of what is good and somebody else is insisting that we sing it because they believe this is the only way to show us down now i think both ends are unacceptable that may be true of a small minority but would you say that the majority of those who sing bande matram do it to provoke muslims or do they how do it be, out of a sense of national how, pride how can it be that if i sing it out of national pride they must also sing out of a national pride but let me just say one thing that there is a small area where somebody can have a different point of view about the manner in which you show your allegiance or your patriotism. And the Supreme Court in the Jehovah's Witnesses case has said that if you don't want to stand up because of your religion when the national anthem is sung, we have no problem. Now, if the Supreme Court can, can allow them this, Supreme Court can also allow different views about Vande Matram. Our own party decision taken by Jav Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru and Maulana Azad was that this is our national song, we must sing it with full respect, but if somebody doesn't want to sing it, we have no problem. This is what they said. One last final question. If some member of the Muslim community were to come to you, both as a minister but also as a fellow Muslim, and ask you, should I or shouldn't I sing? I will tell them to sing. I will tell him, please stand by me, shoulder to shoulder, and sing it for the nation. Salman Khushid, a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much.